This is Newswire from NASDAQ Market Site, and I'm Matthew Bishop of The Economist. I'm talking with Bada Jaffa, who is CEO of Crescent Group, and increasingly uh, trying to find entrepreneurial solutions to some of the big challenges facing um, younger people in the Middle East and the Gulf region. So, Bada, um, let's start with the part of the region that's been very successful for many years now, the, the energy industry, and uh, which is your day job. Um, what do you see as the sort of 10 year outlook for, 10 to 20 year outlook for energy? Well, if we take a step back and look at the, the world today, uh, about approximately 7 billion people, mm -hmm. uh, habits, uh, people are having more and more affluent habits. Uh, and of course, the numbers, number, the population numbers are increasing drastically mm -hmm. as well. So if you really look at it um, as being a, a challenge of finding uh, available uh, resources to fuel those energy requirements, and those, those resources have to also be affordable, um, and they also have to be acceptable, acceptable being environmentally acceptable. So we have limited options with us uh, today, um, and it's a combination of fossil fuels, uh, we have nuclear, uh, and of course we have the renewable energies. And what's important is as we look forward to try and meet those challenges that we have to uh, pragmatically look at a, a mix between all those three. Now, just to put things into perspective, today the globe is burning approximately 250 million barrels of oil per day equivalent just to fuel its energy mm -hmm. needs. So that's including all the other energy besides oil? That's just yes. converted to It's oil. just all converted mm -hmm. in, a, in a per barrel mm -hmm. basis yeah. equivalent. Um, now, if uh, with the current pro pro projections of demand between now and going forward, we will need approximately 400 million uh, barrels of oil per day equivalent to fuel energy needs in 2050. Um, so that's uh, quite a drastic uh, increase. Um, but that's assuming that the world uh, lives uh, today in different regions of the world on the same living standards. Mm -hmm. uh, think about this uh, scenario where the remainder of the world overnight lives with, lives with the living standards of, uh, of, Europe, of, mm -hmm. of Europeans, uh, which by the way is uh, the most efficient uh, in the developing uh, uh, countries. From, from an energy perspective. From an energy perspective. Mm -hmm. If that happened, then overnight we would need an extra 250 million barrels of oil per day just to satisfy that uh, fueling. So you see with the increase in living standards and of course the increase in population, being able to fuel uh, those two increases is going to be a major challenge going forward. So that, on the face of it, is pretty good for anyone with lots of oil? Well, not necessarily. Um, you have, as I said, a number of options to be able to fuel that. And so, uh, so let's look at gas. And everything needs to be looked at within the context uh, and really audited within the context of the three A's which I mentioned, mm -hmm. that being accessibility, availability, uh, and uh, the acceptance. So, you know, it being environmentally friendly or mm -hmm. acceptable at least. Um, and so let's let's break it break it up. So yeah. if we look at oil, I mean, oil today is uh, really uh, allocated towards transportation. Um, renewables. Well, renewables does deal with the third A, which is acceptability. Uh, of course, there is a cost, environmental cost, for producing uh, renewable energy, and some are worse than others. But on the whole, it's uh, it's acceptable. Um, you, the problem where you hit with renewables currently today is uh, availability um, and security of supply. Uh, the reliability of renewables today uh, is uh, still not uh, at a stage where we can actually rely on it to fuel that energy. It's about 30% reliance reli reliability today. And if What's not reliable about it? Depending on the um, uh, technology, so you know, versus mm. wind or, or, or solar, solar uh, yeah. uh, you have different uh, load cycles, mm. and uh, you, you will never get 100%. Uh, so it's a variant. So on average, uh, it's about 30%. Okay. Uh, now, affordability. Well, the problem is, again, because of the subsidy requirements to actually get renewables up to a level where we can use it uh, and, and rely on it, um, today, renewables on average cost around 150 barrels of oil per day equivalent. Mm -hmm. uh, with today, with oil at $100, so that's a 50% increase or 50% subsidy we'd need to have to really scale that, which is not sustainable today. So. So um, renewables has limitations. Now we look at natural gas. And natural gas is, uh, in terms of availability, is, is abundant, especially with the shale phenomenon that has been uh, really rocking the industry over the last uh, few years. Um, and so we have no problems uh, assuming that there will be enough gas to fuel 
uh, that uh, the rise in energy today. Uh, I believe the expectations are that we have at least 250 to 300 years of remaining gas reserves. Um, so availability is not a problem. Affordability, well, today, if you just look at uh, US, uh, the US uh, gas prices um, and, Hen and Henry Hub, uh, is equivalent to around $25 per barrel equivalent. Of oil, so you're getting about a, quarter so of the, a third or a quarter of the price. Absolutely, third or quarter of the price. So affordability, you know, thumbs up. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and then the issue again of, um, uh, of, of damage to planet, mm -hmm. uh, and is it acceptable? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's a third uh, less pollute, pollutive than uh, gas, sorry, than coal, and about half uh, than oil. So it is a far better than, than two. So I think the, the message that I'm trying to say is going forward to meet the energy challenges of the world, natural gas is the fuel of choice. Uh, and until we're able to, with techn technological advancements, deal with some of the problems with renewables, um, that is going to be our solution. So there's a lot of excitement in America about, the, as you say, the shale gas phenomena, the unconventional reserves that are being got at through fracking and so forth. Um, you know, how, as you look at it from... Uh, the Gulf, you know, how does America look? Do you think it's going to have the political uh, environment which will allow it to make the most of that opportunity? Do you, do you feel it's a competitor now that's going to start stealing market share from some of the other parts of the world that have really been able to dominate the, uh, the oil and gas market for so long? Well, what, I've, what I love about it and what I think uh, people in my part of the world uh, also uh, have... Uh, um, you know, are excited by it, is the fact that through the entrepreneurship principles that are applied uh, in in the U.S. Uh, business world, uh, we have a f situation whereby previously unavailable uh, reserves mm -hmm. in um, unconventional rocks uh, are, are now being accessed through the application of technology, which in a very short space of time has meant that uh, the U.S. is is going to be self-sufficient uh, when it comes to gas, and beyond that, very likely be a net gas exporter. Now, this has huge ramifications, uh, really globally, but for the U.S. in particular, um, what's that? What 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 what's happening is it's forcing uh, coal-fired power generators to move to gas-fired uh, power generators. So to, today, coal-fired power generation makes up about 50% of all power generation in the U.S., but that's quite uh, rapidly being replaced by gas. Now, what that means from an environmental perspective is that the CO2 emissions in the U.S. have actually fallen back, the levels have fallen back to late 1980s emissions. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, the U.S. being, uh, you know, a non-signatory in the Kyoto Protocol, uh, it really just, through private sector, through private enterprise, uh, has managed to meet uh, some, uh, you know, very So you're saying targets. now America is now on, on target for Kyoto and... So they're doing a better job than most in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you did, I'll give you one example, you know, a renewable friendly uh, Germany, uh, which are, you know, are actually in the last two years, they've had a 5% increase in carbon uh, emissions. And that's really because of uh, uh, policies, Merkel's policies, uh, really attacking the nuclear industry, which, which unfortunately meant that everybody had to go towards lignite which is the most pollutive of all. So you have all these lignite uh, plants, which are now being put up, which is, of course, increasing CO2 emissions. So a lot of confused policy that's going on. And unfortunately, around the world, we don't have examples of conducive, clear, sustainable policies to deal with these problems. And that's, that's a challenge. Um, now, one of the issues that comes up is America becomes more and more self-sufficient in energy. Um, the region that you're from, which has been very much, from a geopolitical sense, you know, the, the partner of America, because America has relied so much on, on the oil and gas. You know, what, what, does, what, what does American self-sufficiency in energy do to that region and, and the geopolitics there at a time when it's already going through quite a lot of turbulence? Well, time will tell. I mean, there are different schools of thoughts that... Uh, as you know, as the U.S. becomes less uh, sufficient, less dependent on uh, reserves from the Middle East, mm -hmm. that uh, that 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 uh, relationship will will change in you know change direction potentially for for uh, the worse or maybe for the better. Mm -hmm. I think time will tell. I think you have you see gas markets are um, 
are such that uh, they are fairly region specific. Mm -hmm. So just because the U.S. becomes a net gas exporter, I don't think will change the dynamics that heavily. Mm -hmm. Uh, the dynamics will change very heavily if U.S. Uh, has ever the ability to become uh, a, a net oil exporter. Mm. And that will change. And from the numbers that I've seen, that is highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. So even with the new unconventional techniques and the oil reserves that are thought to be there, you still don't see that? Yeah, even, with the, new, round, yeah. even with the new unconventional oil, which mm. is a lot of excitement about now, mm. and the numbers that I looked at recently, uh, it is highly, highly unlikely that the U.S. will mm. become self-sufficient from an oil perspective. And therefore, the geopolitics uh, of oil between, say, the U.S. and uh, some of the uh, big, large producers in the Middle East and North Africa, I don't think will uh, change uh, uh, too much uh, anytime soon. Now, already before any of this was being talked about, your part of the world, the UAE, was very much looking at how to how do we prepare for life after oil and, and a general sense in the region that maybe the oil dependency was an opportunity but it needed to be invested uh, wisely in creating a economies that could work after oil. Um, how is that transition process going and how, you know, how, how sustainable yes. you know, is the whole, all this sort of amazing building and yes. innovation? Well, you have uh, policies that have been developed there to really try and ensure going forward over a fairly long time horizon uh, that there is security of supply. So not just uh, relying on uh, fossil fuels or mm. mainly oil and gas to fuel the uh, development within the United Arab Emirates. Mm. And, so, and therefore you've had projects which have been really groundbreaking and uh, uh, unique projects uh, such as the Masdar uh, city a carbon-free, carbon-neutral uh, city, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know the, the Master Institute, which invests in R and D mm. for renewable technologies going forward, um, and of course the the, the nuclear um, policies which mm. they're pursuing uh, for nuclear power, mm. which is on on uh, you know happening at the moment, and I believe the first nuclear power is expected to be produced in 2018 or 2019. Mm. So it really is about diversification uh, away um, and, and towards, as I said, security of supply. Um, what's very important to realize, though, is that the Gulf region of the Middle East, uh, and the, I'll just take the, just take the Middle East, mm. currently today still has plenty of unconventional reserves, right. which is locked up. So it, it, for gas, it has about 45% of the world's unconventional reserves, remaining reserves. And we're only actually producing about 14% of the production. Mm. So uh, the natural um, opportunity would be to take that 14, to go from that 14% of production to the, you know, getting close to the 45%, mm. uh, which would make it on par in Paris Passu with the uh, remaining reserves. But to do that, you really need conducive energy policies to allow you to do that. Mm. And that's something which uh, is not currently happening now. We have subsidy policies that really create a disincentive for energy producers to go and explore and develop those uh, remaining oil and gas reserves. Mm. Uh, and on the other side, you have consumers who are wasting these reserves because they're cheap. Mm. Um, and so that has to, has to change. And I think uh, there were some good policies that were being put in place, but with the onset of uh, what's termed as the Arab Spring, mm. Some of those policies went into reverse, um, so we, we we do have a lot of work to do in that space. Now you mentioned the Arab Spring, and obviously, the region there's tremendous turmoil in the Middle East for a variety of reasons. But you know, one of the one of the factors that was clearly a part in the Arab Spring was the the sense that the young people had that they had no future, that the jobs were hard to come by, Very true. Um, and they were seeing the rest of the world booming and and. Yes. So, so you're getting increasingly involved in trying to find entrepreneurial ways out of that employment crisis. What, what, what are you doing and what are you, what are you, what's the opportunity? Well, you know, Matthew, the, the Arab Spring and, and the reasons behind the Arab Spring are sometimes uh, misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't about, uh, you know, inequality of wealth or an inequality of income, which actually on global standards is, is on par with, uh, with the rest of the world uh, in terms of the rates. Uh, it really is, as you mentioned, an inequality of opportunity. And an inequality of opportunity for the hundreds of millions of youth that live. Today, the current 
Arab world is around 450 million people. But we have a youth bulge. 60% of that is over the age of 20, is, is uh, under 25. Um, and if you combine that or couple that with the huge unemployment that exists, which is around 45% on average across the Arab world, going up to 70% for women on un unemployment in certain parts of the Arab world, you see that you have a demographic time bomb which is on the verge of exploding in our region. Now how, and you see, the, what makes me really nervous, uh, and beyond the necessity to create jobs for sustainable economic development, the importance is really to be able to create those jobs to avoid uh, extremism. Uh, just like the, the uh, US-led Marshall Plan after Second World War was created to uh, make sure that uh, Western Europe didn't fall into communism, we need a plan of that nature, a major, massive plan, to ensure that the Arab world does not fall into, um, into conflict uh, and into extremism. And that is something which can only be achieved uh, through investing in the ecosystem of entrepreneurship uh, in the region and its solutions. Um, and of course, not just available to the elite who can afford uh, higher education, or business schools, which of course is such a small percentage, it has to be available to the masses. And with technology today, uh, we can create that. We can create a virtual learning environment where you can, you can create opportunity for these hundreds of millions of, uh, of youth in the region. But actually, Matthew, you see, it's not only just an Arab world phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon. Uh, and uh, as a recent report, I believe, uh, from The Economist uh, mentioned, um, approximately 300 million youth around the world are considered uh, either not in employment uh, or education uh, or training. Um, and so I think there's a term which uh, is referred the to. Needs, yeah. The needs. Mm. So 300 million youth. Now, you know, there's a proverb that says, you know, uh, you know an idle mind is uh, a devil's workshop. So what we need to make sure is that uh, uh, the devil doesn't have 300 million workshops to work with and, and the only way to do that is to make sure that we have productive youth going forward and like I said entrepreneurship is key. So you know, what, what, when you talk about a Marshall type plan, um, what, what are you doing to, to help that happen? Well you see a Marshall plan was a massive and fast infrastructure, mm -hmm. investment in infrastructure in uh, Western Europe um, and that is uh, theoretically possible in the Arab world today. The money, though, is not going to come from the places that need it. Uh, really, the only region of the world, region of the Arab world today, that can probably afford to do that type of investment is the Gulf region. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the buoyant oil prices, the Gulf region has probably made uh, an incremental uh, revenue of approximately 600 billion U.S. dollars since the Arab Spring began. So, if the Arab, if those countries were to invest just a, a small portion of that increase the marginal you know increase in those revenues into high impact infrastructure investments mm -hmm. across the arab world uh, and especially in post revolutionary countries then there is a chance that that will create the sort of jobs that we need on average do you see billion, that happening i haven't seen it start mm -hmm. um, i'm an optimist so i always feel that there's room for something like that to happen but it does take collaboration, cross-regional collaboration, uh, and urgency. Uh, and that's something that unfortunately the region hasn't displayed in recent times. And what's the, what can be done to help promote entrepreneurship? I mean, you mentioned obviously education is one thing, yes. but I mean, are there other policy changes that could be implemented or things that uh, investors can do to encourage entrepreneurship? I think absolutely. I mean, like I said, today we have a, a situation where the SMEs, which is really the prime uh, creator, job creator in the world, it's about 70% in all developed countries. The small, the small today and medium businesses. Yes, yeah. and today it's less than 20% in the Arab world. So mm. how are we going to get those SMEs from making up 20% of the economy to 70% of the economy? And there are ways to do that. Education is important. Uh, dealing with the job skills mismatch is extremely important. Advocacy, the ease of doing business. The Arab world is not the easiest place to set up a business right now. And on the way out, you know, things like bank, bank uh, rubsy, uh, uh, you know, protections aren't in place. Access to capital is huge. Today, less than 20% of all capital in the Arab world is available to SMEs. 
uh, and that's just that's that's not acceptable. We have to pull that number up. Um, and of course, corporate governance. This is something which is critical. Corporate governance is conducive to healthy economic systems, and that's something which I'm passionate about. In fact, I founded the Pearl Initiative in partnership with the United Nations Office of Partnerships a few years ago mm -hmm. as a private sector initiative to really try and create a culture of transparency and accountability in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. um, and corporate uh, governance is one of the key uh, tenets of the Pearl Initiative. Uh, and to date, what we found is when we deal with uh, promoting corporate, corporate governance, not from a regulation standpoint, but from an incentive-based standpoint, so really talking to our business leaders and explaining to them that there is value creation by adopting these models, uh, then we find that they are very receptive to those type of discussions. And today, in the space of two years, we have, uh, this is the Pearl Initiative, we have over 172 or 800, 172 companies who have joined us in this mission. Uh, and, and we hope many more will. And these companies are not just countries in the Arab world. These are multinationals uh, who, are also, um, available, who are also working within the Arab world today. I mean, how long do you think the Arab world has to get itself on the right track in terms of job creation for this time bomb not to go off? Yeah, about 6 p.m. tonight. <laughs> but really, I mean, it's, you're, urgent. It's, it's, it's urgent. It's today. And do you think many other people besides yourself who are influencers in the region really understand that urgency? I do believe that more and more people are understanding that it is a problem that needs to be dealt with today. I don't think enough people are uh, focused enough on finding the solutions to that problem. Well, Bell Jaffa, thank you very much for talking with Newswoman. Thank you, Matthew.